Can you hear me? Yes, you sound froggy, but we can hear you. Oh, good. It's like, it's, it's one of life's little, um, um, yeah, humor oh. is that when I get sick, I get laryngitis. I feel fine. Yeah. And I can't talk. And talking is what I do for a living. So that's wow. really annoying. Funny when the universe uh, just throws you a curveball like that. And it says, go lay down. Right. And then you're too hoarse to actually tell the universe to shut up and go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell it for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> as, your, as your wingman. There you go. Well, you look great, so. Thank you. That's, there you go. Yeah. I feel good. You look kind of cute, too. Thanks. You know, we kind of have this like color thing happening each week where we don't even plan this. We literally just kind of show up wearing something very similar. Imagine my surprise. Ah. <laughs> oh, you've got such a good story to tell us too today. So excited. It was, it's been amazing because it doesn't always work out. Um, yes. So when it does, it's just like miraculous. Yeah. It's I kind of want to. I kind of want to build all the um, kind of the questions around this case that you're going to talk about today, because um, some of the questions and comments that came in, not this week, but the week before I've been kind of tabling. And this is a good week to, I think, um, kind of ask you your opinion on some of these things after you tell your story, I think would be great. This is a patient that contacted me last March. And then some things happen and they had to postpone. She has CRPS full body, 2002. She had a surgery on her foot and the surgeon didn't know about CRPS. And she woke up, woke up from the surgery with a cast on her foot with burning level nine pain. Okay. And he left the cast on anyway. Then... 2007, she had a basically a brick wall, crushed her left big toe. Okay. And that had to be amputated. The, the distal part of the toe was amputated. That turned into CRPS, spread up to her knees. For patients that are listening, do you want to just do a quick like definition of CRPS? Or yeah. sorry, we just have we have a lot of lay people listening these days. So it used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, but that's not accurate. Right. Complex regional pain syndrome is not any more accurate. Right. It is a denervation condition where the nerves disconnect from the peripheral tissue. So it's like phantom limb pain, except you still have the limb. Right. Right. So the nerves are disconnected, but the limb is still there. Right. And um, so then in two seven, 2017, in 2017, one day, it went from both of her legs up to her knees to her full body, including her head. And what that means is that instead of just her feet being represented in her thalamus instead of her sensory cortex. Right. Her whole body became central pain. It's like having a stroke, but on both sides of the thalamus at one time. Right. And so she's been between a seven and a nine ketamine infusions, um, all kinds of meds, nerve stimulators, um, uh, everything that pain management can do and neurosurgery. And um, so we use the frequency to quiet 40 with the thalamus 89, the midbrain, and you apply it neck to feet. <clears throat> and then because both, this is annoying. <laughs> it's going to be the longest hour for you. But you know, everybody's just hanging on your, your words anyways. So, so lean in everybody. Then because both of the nerves 
in her feet were crushed. They weren't inflamed. They were disconnected. So to reconnect them from her knees to her feet, I ran increased secretions in the nerve. And when there's a traction injury or a disc, you want to quiet the inflammation that makes the nerve painful. When the nerve is painful because it's crushed, you increase secretions in the nerve. That's Jody Adams did that in her CRPS presentation a couple of years ago. So neck to feet, knees to feet. She's been on oxygen for four years. On room air, her oxygen saturation is between 83 and 88. When her pain dropped, after 15 minutes, it went from a nine to a seven. It was 40 and 89 running. 40 and 89 and 81 through 96. Yeah. And then I ran concussion in Vegas from her neck to her knees. So three machines. <clears throat> three machines. She's in a recliner covered with the blankie. Yeah. And I took her hand out and put the pulse ox on her. And her oxygen saturation was 95 and her pulse was 60. Three, wow. just from getting the pain down. Right. At the end of an hour, her pain was between a zero and a one. That was Monday. Tuesday, we did, she came in at a seven instead of a nine. So right. Monday, I warned her it wasn't going to last. Yeah. When it comes back, if it comes back, you're going to mind it more. Yeah. What's interesting is that she is a Pentecostal minister. She's a pastor. She builds churches, runs churches, is on boards, and her, her faith sustains her. So she never identified as a pain patient. So when she went from a nine to a one, she actually wasn't surprised. And the person who told her about me was somebody that saw a YouTube introductory webinar or talked to one of our patients. And it's a pain psychologist who referred her. And that's how she found me. Wow. So when she went to a one, I didn't, we, when she got down to a one, for everybody, practitioners and patients, when somebody has thalamic pain, all of the information about her body stops in the thalamus. There's no representation for her feet, especially in her sensory motor cortex. It's all in the pain centers in the brain. So when she was a zero to a one, I switched the lower leg frequencies to scarring in the nerve. And I switched the neck to feet to increase secretions in the sensory and motor cortex and had her move her feet so that her brain, before she stood up, so that her brain would know where her feet were. And then wipe a mode, increase secretions in the cerebellum and had her move her feet and you could see the change in coordination. So at first it was like she was looking for them. And then it was, oh, and the movement smoothed out. I went back to the sensory cortex, back to the cerebellum, and then got her to stand up and had her stand and feel her heels because her toes are what were injured. Right. So feel your heels and then her posture straightened up and to get her cerebellum engaged, I did the, um, the thing you do with Parkinson's patients, touch my finger and move the finger and touch it so that, and you could watch her body get recoordinated. We did the same thing the second day, only it took less time. Um, and then last night, 
I sent her home with a custom care with a one hour program and a four hour program for the midbrain. So maybe she could get some sleep. So we'll find out tomorrow how that worked. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it isn't a hundred percent full body CRPS. We had four or five successes and one failure. So you just keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best, but it's, it's putting it together. So the end of yesterday, the first surgery she had on her right foot, they actually tacked the nerve on the medial side of her right foot, they actually tacked the nerve to the connective tissue and that's what damaged it. So there's scar tissue between the nerve and the periosteum, the nerve and the fascia. And to mobilize it, it's just, if you can just lay your finger on top of it, just barely touching it, because I didn't want to ramp it up too much. So scarring the nerve, scarring the periosteum, she was able to move it more, ramped up the pain. Then I did 40 and 396, because when you take apart scar tissue, it creates inflammation and then finished up with 81 and 49. So you, with CRPS, you work both ends at one time because it's, it's a peripheral to central, then central to peripheral, but there's, there's two ends of it and we have the ability to treat both. So that was like the high spot of my week. That's fantastic. I love stories like that. When you have something so complicated the patient that thank goodness she has faith. Um, and people, patients don't need to be religious, you know, but hope, right. Something believing in something, the universe yeah. somehow, somewhere we're going to get better. And I think confidence as a practitioner, and we touched on it before, when you look somebody in the eye and say, nothing you have or say is going to scare me. Right. So there's like some, some faith and hope coming from you as well. Now, when you have a patient that has something as complicated as CRPS, are you level with them from the beginning? Like this might not last or yeah. Okay. It's like i would level with them from the beginning in um, this might not work. Yeah. Right. Cautious optimism. Yeah. Um, if it works, it might not last. As a matter of fact, it probably won't last. Right. My goal today is to not make you worse. Right. If you end up the same, that's a win. So you right. are there. And then when it does work, you know, inside of 15 or 20 minutes, her respiration changed, her body relaxed. That was the first thing before the pain went down. She said, I think it's down to an seven or an eight, but I feel more relaxed. And then it's like, whew, okay, it's going to work. And right. then it usually takes 60 minutes. So I'll be back. Right. My husband and I visited in the other room and she was in the recliner. I covered her eyes up with a towel and she actually, she was out of pain. And I left her run for another 45 minutes because she basically hasn't slept in four years. Right. So I just let her sleep. Right. That was fun. Touching on this, um, I'm going to just take us along the journey as I love to do. When you, um, when you say like this has to run for a bit longer, you know, within 15 minutes, um, is that just your experience with those frequencies in this condition that you, it's kind of time dependent, I guess, right? This is not a put it on for a minute and, um, you know, the pain's going to go down instantly. Cause we do have conditions and frequencies where it, something does happen and change within 22 seconds. This is not one of them. So practitioners, if you're listening, if you have a patient like this, this is a long treatment. This is not a in and out of your clinic in 45 minutes. So three machines. Um, and it takes, it's like cervical trauma fibro. It's right. exactly the same neurologic process. Right. Um, it takes 60 minutes. Yeah. And then at 60 minutes, um, 
I took her pulse and oxygen every 15 minutes and checked on her pain score. And it went from a nine to a seven, seven to a four or five, and then 15 minutes later. So at the 60 minute mark, she was at a one, zero. And then I let her sleep for 45 minutes and then she was at a zero. Right. Um, so it's like cervical trauma fibro. Right. And then I had an Achilles tendinopathy patient just before this one. And the Achilles, you know, measuring around the ankle went from 26 centimeters to 25 and a half. Wow. Next day, it was 24 after an hour. Wow. So it's 124 and 191. Yeah. And then she'd had a fracture and torn ligaments in the ankle. And I ran all of that. So there were three machines on her ankle. And the 81, when I palpated her adductors, 81 and 10. So her adductors on the leg that was affected were super tight, the pectineus and brevis. And that takes 60 minutes. The Achilles takes 60 minutes. There's no point in treating the Achilles without treating the tight leg muscles. Right. So that was three machines, 81 and 10 on a precision, on a custom care. Yeah. Um, 124 and 77 on a precision care. Yep. And then a precision care to do the ligaments and the bone marrow edema at the talus fracture that she had that started it all. So okay. it's just time dependent. Yeah. Things just need to, to run. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to steer the ship just a little lateral right now. When you have a patient that has a I'm going to put this in air quotes for our audio listeners, adverse reaction to a frequency, pain goes up, uh, heart rate goes up, uh, anxiety goes up, something happens that the patient feels icky. Do you let it run because it's resonating with something that needs to be done? Or do you press pause and shift the frequency? a good question thank you yeah yay no it depends on what the adverse reaction is so if they get anxious that happens when um i think when the endorphins go up so high in some patients that triggers a sympathetic response so they just say wow i don't feel good just it's it's are we done yet? It's, I think I have to, maybe I left the iron. So right. They just get anxious. Yeah. It's absolutely. Just give me a second. And you go to 40 and 562, just quiet down the sympathetics. And that takes about two minutes. Thanks, Roger Billica. So you quiet down the sympathetic reaction. If you're running 40 and something and the pain goes up, you push pause. You ask about infection and you go to 61 or 64 and 42 and 64 and 63. So there are certain side effects that are predictable that you can either treat with 40 and 562 or treat with the frequencies for infection or just push pause. But the important thing is not to panic. Right. I have in the core seminar, we've warned everybody about virtually every adverse reaction I've ever seen. So if you listen to the core often enough, enough of them stick, and maybe I should put them all in one place so you can read all the the adverse all the scary things all at one time right elf wants to know the settings for infection um pus and pus encapsulated you talk you you tell them you what want are, me what are the settings for infection what do you mean the settings for infection 64 and 42 64 and 63 oh, uh, oh. pus encapsulated right yeah i'm sitting yeah. over with the q a Sorry, I was like, where is this coming from? I don't have my, my questions up. 
There we go. I've got it on the side. Right. So yes, so it, it isn't just cut and dry of what's the adverse reaction. Um, I know we talk about uh, Keith Pine lovingly when we talk about 94 and 94, and there is a um, quote unquote adverse reaction. Some patients, when you run 94 and 94, get sick, you don't press pause and abandon it in the sports world. You roll them over on the side, give them a waste basket, let them throw up and then it's done. So that's a whole other, um, way of thinking of it, um, with certain patients that's not going to work with the general demographic though. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what practitioners need to know is if you make somebody worse, and if you've been doing this long enough, you will. Um, and that's okay. We have antidotes, like there's virtually an antidote for every adverse reaction that we have. So like you said, don't panic. Um, you're on the right track. You created change. You know, this is going to help lead you down the road to potentially what's really going on. So nothing drives me crazier is when I see people talking about um, don't use the forties on the Facebook page. What is with that? Who started that? I don't know. It's like it's like when you're in junior high and like there's a rumor going around about something. Please stop the rumor that 40s are bad. 40s are fantastic. I wouldn't be able to practice without 40s. If you the the reaction to 40 is diagnostic. Correct. Only happens with hidden or occult infections. Right. And an occult infection is a bad thing. Right. So. Yes. The time, the times that I've encountered that were dental infections and the patient sent me chocolates and flowers after, because we found something that was hidden. So yay for us. Yay. Um, so yeah, things are adverse reactions are diagnostic and you've got enough training between the core and all these webinars and all the things that we do to, uh, figure out what's going on and, it's like I said, it's a good thing. It's diagnostic. You probably found something that you can, you know, alter your treatment to. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was, that was one of the questions with, um, when something bad happens, do we let it, do we let it run its course? And if something bad happens the first time, so anxiety, let's say somebody's anxiety comes up, will it come up again? Is this a frequency that we need to avoid, do you know where I'm going with it? Um, no, it's, it's, if it's, if they, the anxiety comes up in two places, one, when they have a vestibular injury and you hit 94, 94, right. Um, or you run concussion and that night they have a terrible headache and they're sick all the next day. That's a vestibular injury. Right. Um, if you, are running, let's say 40 and 10 or 40 and 89, and they get, first they get stoned, but then they get anxious. The endorphins ramp up so high, so fast, that I think it triggers a sympathetic response. And it's like, when you can tell that they're getting anxious, you, you stand there and you watch their face. Right. And then you just, in my world, you just switch to 40 and 562. If they're a patient that tends to be anxious anyway, you're gonna run concussion in Vegas and maybe throw on another machine that has 40 and 562 while you're running 40 and 10. Right. So the custom cares are so inexpensive that you can afford to have single frequency combinations plugged into a custom care that you just have on your cart. Right. And you can just do 40 and 562, it's like, I just, I don't feel right. This just, it's making me really nervous. Is there something wrong? It's like, no, here, let me push pause. Let right. Me put this machine up. That'll take, and then you run 40 and 562 for, it only takes two or three minutes and they calm down. Then you keep that running when you go back to 40 and 10. Right. But Have you ever had anybody that had a um, adverse reaction to 81 and 10? Um, yeah, there's, I have one, maybe it's not actually adverse. It's predictable. Right. If they have both full body pain and they have 
full body or leg increase in tone or spasticity. So you know that they are a 40 and 10, but 40 and 10 will make 81 and 10 patients worse right. and vice versa. Right. On that patient, there were two machines from the beginning, neck to feet, 40 and 10 and 81 and 10 at the same time. And I have no idea how the spinal cord sorts it out. Wow. But her body pain went down and the spasticity of her tongue went down. Over 60 minutes, she had um, a glioblastoma at the age of 18 months. She had surgery at 18 months. And then when she was three, the tumor came back. And instead of doing surgery, they used radiation. And by the time I got her, she was 27. She was ataxic. Her pain level was eight all the time. Her, the tone in her legs was spastic. And it's like, okay, the body pain diagram was clearly 40 and 10. The tone and spasticity was clearly 81 and 10. But with the pain level at a seven, you know, you can't run 81 or you're going to increase substance P because that's the secretion on the spinal cord. Right, right. So from the beginning, I used two machines on her. She was there for a week. At the end of the week, she went home with two custom cares, 40 and 10, and the 81 and 10 were on both of them. Okay. And so she ran one 40 and 10, and this was seven years ago wow. since finished college back to work i mean she's got a life but she has to use microcurrent every day because the radiation destroyed her spinal cord well the blood supply to that section of her spinal cord right right so yeah it's they they antidote each other and they do different things that's fantastic. That's really, really, really interesting. Um, Wouldn't you love to know what we're doing? Yeah. Where's Terry Phillips when you need him? It's just, you know, you think about this mathematical equation that these two just kind of cross each other out and then nothing happens, but how the body sorts, well, even just how the body sorts out having two and three machines, how how that works or five machines, you know, that's a question I get all the time too, is when you're running two machines, can you put the contacts on the same towel? Yes, because you, otherwise you, if you're running four machines on a patient, you don't need force. You don't need eight towels on the patient. Um, two towels. Most of the time you sometimes I'll shrink it up. So there'll be four sets, right? You have like one neck to feet, and then maybe I'll have one under the low back or working on a, on the abdomen, so on and so forth. But yeah, it's amazing how just the two machines can, or three machines or five machines can talk to each other. And if anybody's that's listening is thinking that's not possible, you and me both, I do not, it does not make any sense to me, but. George says it's because the machines don't see each other, the frequency oh. mix in the patient. And I'm not sure I believe him, but what he says makes more sense than my complete inability to explain it. And it's one of those things that once you do it and you know it works, I'm sort of over it. Like, I don't really care how it works. I know it does. We do it all the time. So... When, when you scramble an egg, yep. do you know the exact chemistry that happens when you put the heat in the frying pan and you, there is a chemistry that happens to the egg white and yolk protein as it turns from a liquid into a scrambled egg. Yes. I don't know what that chemistry is, but that doesn't keep me from making scrambled eggs. That's very true. It must be getting close to dinner time because the egg analogy and my lasagna analogy. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> my lasagna, when I teach a sports course, I have this lasagna slide about layering. And I kind of want to talk about that because that was another question about you say once a frequency is done, you know that it's done and then to change it. So that's kind of 
we do say that I think in the core though, right? Like when we're doing the practicums where we're running something and then we, you have the ability to be like, Hey, the smush is now firming up. It's done. That doesn't mean you never go back to that frequency though. It's done in that moment. Um, not done forever and ever and ever. Um, so with really common kind of musculoskeletal things, you will always kind of start off with the nerve to quiet the pain down. Um, but then let's just say you go deeper and deeper into a different layer and then the pain goes up Well, that's the nerve again, right? So you want to treat for scarring or inflammation in the nerve that'll quiet down. So it's never a one and done. I like it with her foot. The right. Treating the scar tissue with one machine and then switching to from scarring in the nerve to inflammation in the nerve, scarring in the periosteum to inflammation in the periosteum, then back to scarring in the nerve because you you tease the scarred tissue apart right. a little bit at a time. And yes. when the pain ramps up, you don't just keep pounding on it. You take the pain back down and then you tease it apart again. And then you take the pain back down and you, and you just do what the patient tolerates. There's a point at which pain patients are used to being abused right physical therapists and yes doctors. it's supposed to hurt no no it's not it's not good for your brain for your foot to hurt that's not good for your brain right so you take it when it gets to a four then you take it back down to a one or a zero then you play with the scar tissue till it gets to a four and you can watch the patient's face the face changes when it gets between a four and a five, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of questions popping up, but I just want to finish this one thought before we go to the, the questions is, and you just said it, most of the patients that you see that have been in chronic pain or athletes are expecting you to beat them up in the clinic. I can't tell you how many times where patients are like, can you press harder? I'm like, I could, but why would I want to create trauma? to the tissue. They're like, what do you mean trauma? You have to squish it. No, a lot of the times we're working on really deep muscles and I don't care how good your hands are. You have to go through healthy, superficial tissue to access the deep stuff. You're creating trauma to the superficial stuff. So you have to explain to your patients that the, the current is doing all the heavy lifting. Your hands are just there to guide and help and palpate um, and so I think for the practitioners listening out there, it's different, your hands, your palpation, your treatment, everything changes and lightens up because it's healthier for the patient patients that are listening. I'm sorry, any FSM practitioner worth their salt is not going to stick their elbow into you. Um, they don't need to. So no. it, it, it doesn't help. Um, when I was in college, I, had a um, professor throw a big tenderloin on the counter um, and we're all staring at this big thick piece of meat and he stabbed it with his hand really fast and he's like what happened and we're like nothing he's like you're right and he was telling a story and as he was telling a story really lightly he was just putting his fingers and cross fibering very gently and slowly and by the end of the 20 minute story his fingers had gone right through the meat and that visualized stays with me. You don't hammer, you don't pound, you don't jam anything in there. You go lightly to get through the tissue and then enter the world of FSM and you just, you don't need to. So patients don't expect to get beaten up and practitioners, you just added 20 years onto your manual therapy skills because you're not going to be digging around. Okay. Let's get to some questions. Really. Oh, sorry. Go on right frequencies you just follow the wave down and yeah into something sharp pain with gentle pressure it's scarring in a nerve yeah right yeah. yeah exactly okay um first question up here can you use more than one magnetic converter system simultaneously on a patient along with several towel electrode setups i've done this on pediatric patients so we've got a towel when we were treating um 
Heather's daughter, Hannah, we had, Heather had her hands on the baby as one contact and we ran concussion in Vegas with the magnetic converter with the two AFS kids. Um, uh, it's a full body neurologic condition, it's viral and they have flaccid paralysis. And we did neck to feet with wraps, but then we ran concussion in Vegas with the converter across their abdomen with kids. It's not so weird. Um, I don't tend to use the converter in the office with adult patients. No. It's weird enough having current you can't feel and frequencies you can't hear. But when you start with something with blinky lights and what is that? It's too, I don't like spending 20 minutes of the visit explaining what this thing is. Right. But with children, nobody cares. No, that's true. I'm going to pop down to the bottom because it's back on the magnetic converter. Um, what do you suggest running on magnetic converter versus wet towels? Example is concussion in Vegas better with wet towels or all okay to use magnetic converter and use wet towel to treat the musculoskeletal injury, say shoulder injury from checking. Um, For me, um, in general, Concussion in Vegas is okay with the converter unless you're treating somebody with atrial fib, SIBO, gastroparesis, where you actually need to just drive the vagus nerve electrically to conduct. Like you want to go from where it starts down to the pubic bone and you turn the current up to 150 and you polarize it positive on 81 and 109 besides the rest of the vagal tone. Um, so that's when I use current, but at night when I run concussion in Vegas on myself, I use a converter. Um, I never use a converter in the clinic, like ever. Like I just, I'm wet towels and electro girl. So um, yeah. And 124 and 77, will work like the first thing I treated on myself when we very first got the converters 10 years ago, seven years ago. Wow. That was a long time. Acute was an acute facet injury. I'd done some sort of extension thing that made my low back sore. I said, I'll try this. And I put acute facet on the converter. Yeah. Put it on my back. And then I sat at the kitchen counter doing emails and then it's like, uh oh, that doesn't hurt. So that's when I found out the converter worked. Hmm. Um, okay. Lynette, I, I want to answer any failures you've experienced with treating a patient you might have done differently now. Oh my God. Yes. Can I get the first five years of my practice back, please? Exactly. <laughs> Everybody I treated between 1997 and 2010, I'd like to get back because there, there were so many, back in 97 through 2005, we still thought it was the muscle. Right. I was treating the muscle. What an idiot, right? It took until 2010 before I, 2005 I began to suspect, but by 2010, we found out it was never the muscle. It's never the muscle. No. So that's not, I want to pause for a sec. Cause that's, that's not to say we don't treat the muscle. We treat the muscle. We treat the connective tissue. We treat the fascia. We don't treat the muscle. Like the quad is tight, must treat quad like that. That's no, we don't do that. We treat but, causing the muscle to be tight. Right. So tight. So pectineus adductor and quadriceps is 81 and 10, right? And that leads to 124 and 77 at the knee and maybe the ankle. Right. So you're treating the tendinopathy, but unless you relax the quad by treating the spinal cord and the patient didn't know they had a disc in their neck anyway, until you push here on the front of their neck, that hurt, yeah. That is what's causing your leg. Excuse me. Right. Yeah. Now, again, going back to our very first podcast is what is your why? 
you have to think, well, why is the muscle tight? Don't accept that it's tight. Just don't accept it. Just don't. It's not tight. It didn't come from outer space. It came from a reason. Muscles just don't get tight ever. Yep. Then you ask them if they ever had a kidney stone. Why do you ask? Well, as the QL on the left is really, really tight and the QL on the right is not. So what side was your kidney infection in? The left. Imagine that. Right. Well, even in, in an acute injury, when I see an athlete that just fell, got smushed, tripped, did something, yes, muscles are tight, but it didn't just get tight. That muscle tightened up to protect a torn ligament, tendon, connective tissue. There's bleeding that happened there. So like treating the muscle is so far down my list. Um, Treat the bleeding, treat the torn and broken. Yeah. Treat all the things. Um, Yeah. That's all I wanted to to make sure because people are like, well, what do you mean? It's never the muscle. It's just, it's, it, it just never is. We treat it. We treat muscle tissue. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm going to jump to another question really here before we go on any further. Um, I will read it because your voice is bad. I have just started a case of stubborn infertility from endometriosis plus question mark also features constipating IBS. Hema view shows significant worm shaped parasites, history of antibiotics and steroids test shows lactobilicus dominance in bowel oh, and absence of E. Coli age 36. So, yes. So. <laughs> and then Phil, Phil and Maddie are both from Australia and, um, hello, Australia. Hello, Australia. So Phil, treat the parasites. That's the first thing because um, the parasites are turning off the vagus. The vagus is why she has constipating IBS. So there's no point doing anything for the IBS, including diet and all those other things we do until you get the vagus turned back on and the vagus isn't gonna get turned back on until she has, gets rid of the parasites. So parasites are first. Um, you can treat the scar tissue and the endometriosis at the same time. So being an Australian naturopath, you're going to be using herbs and wormwood and whatever other things you use. And then um, the uh, antibiotics and steroids are well. Um, Then uh, once you get rid of the parasites and that's what, 10 days, wait six weeks and do another round. So you're six, seven weeks into it before the parasites are gone. Then you can start treating the vagus once the parasites are gone. Then you treat the scar tissue from the endometriosis. And um, the lactobacillus and E. coli thing is interesting. I was taking 50 billion colony forming units of lactobacillus and bifidus every single night, maybe a hundred billion, like two little capsules. And I'd been doing that for eight or 10 months and we did a stool test. I had zero lactobacillus and zero bifidus. And Neil Nathan said, well, they're there, but they don't colonize because you were delivered by C-section and you never got lactobacillus and bifidus when you were born. You, those are colonized when they get up in your nose and mouth as you're coming out the birth canal. Hmm. You have a C-section, your flora is not going to be normal anyway. So that was news to me. So I don't know how to give somebody E. coli because an awful lot of types of E. coli are pathogenic. So I would say maybe give her butyrate because the bacteria are supposed to create butyrate to heal the gut wall. So 
um, and then start once once you get the vagus working and you, you can start teasing apart the scar tissue that scars the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and the colon all together. So that's twice a week for four to six weeks. Yeah, clever for him. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Um, there was somebody that had asked something about treatment duration. I don't know the, if the question went away, like how often, I don't know what it was directed to. How often do you treat? Um, trying to, oh yeah. So how often should you treat every day, every week, every, I'm not sure what that question was about. Cause it's all so different. Um, yeah. there is never a magic formula. In general, it's twice a week for four to six weeks. Um, so if you're local and you're seeing patients that are local, it's twice a week. So you treat, you change the real estate and then you, you don't want to wait a whole week because then it'll go back and you'll end up treating the same thing over and over again. Right. So you treat on Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, two or three days in between so that what you treat the next time will be compensations and you might have to do a drive-by on what you did the first time because it will be different. I see patients, um, these, like these people are here from out of town. So they're here for five days and I see them Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. She went home with a custom care Tuesday night to see what she needs on Wednesday and Thursday. So I'll find out tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock how she did and what we have to do. If she was local, I'd see her three times the first week, twice the second week. If it's something easy like neck, twice a week for four to six weeks. And if you're done at three sessions, you're done. So that's my thing. How about you? Yeah, pretty close. I for sure will see a new patient. I try to get them in twice a week, for sure for the first two weeks. Um, things snowball really fast um, with them, like in a good way, right? So we're always kind of building momentum. You, I agree, you're never treating the same thing like back to back, back to back, you might have to, for sure, like you said, do a drive-by on the nerve, right? Um, you might have to be treating for scarring almost all the time as you're getting deeper, as you're uncoiling those layers. But I think what practitioners need to know is that you're going to increase pliability, tissue health, range of motion so much faster with FSM than you're ever used to. So with that, you can create some instability. Compensations can fly up a lot faster. So your um, exercise re rehabilitation comes into play a lot sooner than it used to. You know, before we'd be treating patients, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks just to get range. And then we'd be talking about incorporating strengthening programs. I'm almost doing it instantaneously. Even if it's an isometric muscle setting exercise for them to do, because the connections are happening faster. What the brain is perceiving, the brain can't understand it. It's like, wait, I was in pain and I was restricted. And what? I, I don't hurt and I can do this all of a sudden? It's like, yes. So it changes a lot faster. Um, Marilyn Miller writes a really, really important comment here. Patients have learned the bad message, no pain, no gain. You couldn't be more right. Um, and so they do, they come expecting this, um, treatment that's going to hurt. And you have to explain to them that that hurt was just creating more trauma, more bleeding, more inflammation. Um, well, they're sensitized anyway. If somebody's been in pain for more than three to 10 days, the spinal cord, when Jay Shaw lectures on that Thursday, right? Is it? No. Because the spinal cord becomes sensitized, the brain becomes sensitized, the sensory cortex map changes. And when you cause more pain, you reinforce the sensitization. Right. It makes it worse. I mean, neurologically, not locally. Right. Right. The other, the other thing I wanted to say <clears throat> is 
if you're doing exactly the same thing every time, you're doing something wrong. You're missing something. Totally. It's like it, there's, it's either unfixable and it's not your fault. Right. Six surgeries you didn't need in the first place. How do you fix that? And, but if you're doing exactly, I hate reruns. So that's what actually makes me stop and think if I have to do the same thing more than once. You miss something. Wait, and that's where I found 40 and 10 and 81 and 10. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. You missed it. Where is it coming from? Otherwise you're just chasing your tail. Um, Okay. I can tell it's almost getting towards the end because all the questions keep coming up and I have so much more to cover. So um, really quickly here, please define again how you differentiate between acute, subacute, and chronic conditions. Uh, acute is usually the first week. That's how we um, categorize it in the core. And it's in the first week because that's when you're treating bleeding. Yeah. Subacute is usually acute on top of chronic. And you're not always treating bleeding, but it's anything from week one to week six, right? You can't use anything for scarring and at, until week six. At the end of week one, the bleeding is usually done. So in the core, it's separated into um, onset to the first week, week one to week five or six, and then chronic is after week six, yeah. I can't think of the last time I used just like something on an auto care for chronic. No, because everything we see is acute on chronic. Right. Chronic doesn't generally hurt. Right. It hurts when you bend over and crack the annulus again. Right. <clears throat> right. Exactly. Hopefully that helps. I'm going to move over to the other question and answer really quick. I think it was just a comment. This is back to Australia. Ultrasound shows possible successful follicles now 11 days. What should my timing be regarding the cycle? Must assume possible fertilization because ah, we don't want to use. Once you're pregnant. Once you're pregnant. She's 36, so she's still got really good progesterone. Um, in the follicles, at least age-wise, um, assuming you get her vagus working, FSH and LH will come back to normal. You get rid of the abdominal adhesions. In my experience, we don't treat once they know they're pregnant. So at week eight, in the first eight weeks, the drive towards implantation is so strong that I've never had difficulty. So she has follicles. So, oh good. Has her on progesterone plus clomiphene. Okay. Yeah. Good luck, Wayne. Philip, good luck. It'll be fun. You'll be a, a, um, a godparent. One, one more quick question before we get to our like closing remarks here. Um, uh, the comment was you'd mentioned um, protocols to run before and after COVID boosters or vaccines. What about flu shot? What about shingles? <laughs> Don't you love how I throw that in there with uh, nine minutes to go? Okay, well, here's my, th my thing. Okay. Um, the last I have in my 25 years treated eight cases of Gillian Bray. Every single one of them was caused proximally by a flu shot. Got the flu shot on Monday, Gillian Bray hit on starting Wednesday or Thursday. Absolutely cause and effect. The flu for me, I go to bed, I take vitamin C, I run the flu protocol, um, I go to bed and uh, when I get a bacterial infection on top of the viral thing, I take antibiotics. And for me anyway, with my health, the flu is not a threat. So I will never in my life get a flu shot because 
Gillian Bure will kill you. And the flu rarely does, although they do have statistics saying, hey, this is why you should get a flu shot. I, that's just my thing. If you want to get a flu shot, or if you have to get a flu shot for whatever reason, um, I would run the flu protocol afterwards to just keep the immune system down. And after then, the after, not before. And then the other thing I do is run concussion in Vegas about 24 hours to get the Vegas turned back on. Um, there would be that and shingles once again. The last eight cases of shingles that I've seen came on virtually immediately, like within a week of the time the patient got a flu sh uh, shingles vaccine. And the doctor said, oh, it's a good thing you got that shingles vaccine because otherwise the shingles would have been so much worse. So people get very passionate about vaccine versus anti-vaccine. I only, it's kind of like, like there are certain medical procedures where I only see the ones that fail. So I have a skewed view of what the risks are. And with every procedure, vaccines, surgeries, drugs, it is a risk benefit ratio. You have to decide what your risk level is. You have to look at the statistics and um, decide what the potential benefit is, what the risk is of the illness. We have a treatment for shingles that's virtually 100% effective, so why would I do that? If I get shingles, I know it within about 24 hours, I treat myself, it goes away, right? Right. The flu, not a thing for me. So, um, but for yeah. those patients who do get the flu shot, shingles shot, COVID shot, um, the um, advice is to run those programs after um, you get your vaccine. I would. I mean, that's what I did. And I, concussion in Vegas. Yep. I ran, I didn't do concussion in Vegas till about five, four days later, but okay. I took an aspirin before the COVID vaccine, the J and J. Yep. I got, my skin was sore, so I knew it worked. And then I ran the COVID protocol that night, took another aspirin the next day and ran the COVID protocol the next day and I was fine. So. Perfect. Was there another question or comment that popped up really quick before we? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, good. We're all caught up. So I had a whole bunch of people asking questions about the advanced, about the sports courses, all the things. We're bursting out of our seats with excitement with the advanced. Um, it's going to be a, a week of crazy good stuff. I got the schedule done. Schedule is done. Schedule is awesome. Yeah. We have the five-day core. We, we start with the five-day core. So the starting date is February 18th, 19th? No. The core. 12th. I, we do the core. Okay. And your, this, that's through Sunday, I think. Yes. The sports course starts Monday. Um, Monday, February 21st and 22nd. So that is live and it will be live streamed. Now, people who take the sports course, if you can come and you feel safe to travel, it's highly recommended that you come and play because you're never going to have more fun with your clothes on. Well, actually people do get their clothes off, but that's for assessment and science purposes. But um, <laughs> um, what we do is so much fun, but that will be streamed. Then we have on the 23rd, the new um, advanced sports course. So for all you geeks that have taken the sports course and you want a little more, this is heavy on the biomechanics, really going down our new theme of why. Why is the shoulder like this? Why doesn't this move? So trying to troubleshoot biomechanically, doing all the new um, 
stuff we're doing with proprioception and balance and intrinsic muscle setting. And, um, it's just the coolest stuff, um, that we've been doing. So that is on Wednesday, the 23rd Jay Shaw is all day Thursday. If you've ever been to Jay Shaw's presentations, they are fantastic. He just, when I think my slides are good, he like knocks, I don't know, like if you could be a professional power pointer, like that's his next job, but he's fantastic. <laughs> all of the graphics department at NIH at his disposal. So man, right, there's that. Sure. And he's been doing FSM or knowing about FSM since 1998. Amazing. Yeah, he's so cool. And what is he lecturing on? What's Jay Shaw's workshop going to be on? It's, I almost don't care. Yeah. <laughs> he could read me the phone book and I wouldn't care. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm pretty sure it's on central sensitization and combining FSM with myofascial pain and chronic pain management, the description, and he's got great course objectives and learning objectives yeah. that will all be in what Kevin sends out. That's okay. Thursday. Okay. Friday and Saturday is the advanced Friday, uh, Friday afternoon. We have you and David Mosnick and can I just say I hate it when we go back to back like I say this every single year yeah. um but this year I'm really upset just saying okay really um, I said it out loud maybe I can get somebody else to do that 90 minute section and then you just do the three hour section the next day whatever <laughs> <laughs> and then um Saturday I'm really excited about because we have John Resky who is the neuro optometrist that gave me prism glasses. And just this week, a patient that I saw in 19, no, in 2002, who has high drops in a fistula and is just tough it out. She got her prism glasses and she can walk in a straight line for the first time in 20 years. It's just extraordinary. And John Reske will tell us how that works. And then after Dr. Reske is Dr. Clearfield, which is the endocrinology of traumatic brain injuries. So people that think they can um, uh, fix brain injuries with just FSM, uh, no, just no. There is a stable state and it's not always just FSM that you need. There are supplements and there are endocrine considerations. And then Sunday, we have our panel, how to, doesn't matter what your specialty is, how to implement FSM in your office and get it to work. So there's four or five different clinical specialties. And then the rest of the day is case reports that are awesome. Um, Tammy, Ben Catholi, Dave Burke, um, there's just a, a whole list and the topics are some esoteric, but some are the sorts of things you see every day. Yeah. And, um, the case reports are all 30 minutes. I love it. Yeah. It's so exciting. So yeah. And then that will all be streamed as well. Correct. Um, so there'll be a in-person and a streamed. Yeah. And, um, the other question I got is if you take do you get the recordings of all the presentations? I would say Kevin is nodding, so that's a yes. Okay, so if I do have to go back to back with David Mesnick and you choose to go to David's, not mine, you will eventually get my recording, correct? Exactly. Okay. So, and we are bringing our cameraman from here, David Meeks, Perfect. and using a local cameraman to pick up B-roll and additional shots so that the awesome. quality of the, of the feed should be really good. It's just going live, especially when, if you're able to, there's, there's, there's nothing like it. It's yes, the conference material is great and the content is good and the slides are good and the, the food is good. Yeah. It's the whole, like the hallway conversations that you get um, to be part of. Yes. Yes. You're exploding and we have to go, but I know it's get it up. All right. So the first day, the lunches are, we're in the pergola. So it's outside and it is, you know, Arizona in February. So it's going to be 76 degrees. Yes. 
That's the first day. The second day, we are going to have um, special interest group tables. So we'll put a clinical condition on the table. And so there'll be PTSD, um, Ehlers-Danlos, um, IBS, uh, neck and low back pain. We'll put different conditions. So if that's kind of your jam, you can sit with that team. And this was Candace Elliott's idea. Lunch goes from 12.30 to 2. And from 1.30 to 2, Candace Elliott is going to do a Tai Chi class yes. for everybody. So oh, I'm excited. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's, there's literally something for everybody. Um, question about the sports course. Um, yes, if you've applied, if you've taken the normal sports course and you've applied for the sports uh, master's course, I will be sending out lists and you can um, go to frequencyspecific.com to get all the information about the advanced and sports courses and everything on frequencyspecific.com website. Frequencyspecific backslash sports. Frequencyspecific.com backslash sports. Oh, perfect. There's a sports segment. But for all the stuff, just go to frequencyspecific.com and that's where I send everybody. Um, when are we coming to the land of Oz? I don't know. Let's do it. Let's go. Well, the time waiver device is approved in Australia. And as soon as David Suzuki gets a CE mark, which is coming closer and closer, we can taste it. Um, then we oh, have Perfect. All right. Okay. okay. This was the fastest hour I think we've ever done. I don't know what happens when we sit down, but thank you everybody for joining us here live and for listening later. Keep your questions and comments coming. Um, yeah. And your sale starts on the Monday after Thanksgiving. Ooh, there's a sale. What's that? PDI, the end of the year sale. End of the year sale. Yes. It's the Monday after Thanksgiving. What is Monday? That? Whatever. And it's uh, not Black Friday. What do you call it on Monday? Cyber Monday? Cyber Monday. Cyber so Monday. The PDI sale starts on that Monday and it goes through the end of the year. And I went to the clinic today, the yes. clinic and training center. Oh, yes. We have ceilings, we have lights, we have cabinets, we it, we will have floors next week and we'll talk about that next week. Oh, I can't wait. And then one day we will do a live from the clinic podcast, you and I. Absolutely. That would be so fun. Hey, let's. In the video conference room, which we have at the clinic. Yes. Okay. I love it. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We got to go. Um, We'll see you all next Wednesday. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.